Good afternoon. Welcome to Pareto Securities oil presentation today. The title of which is Oil is Cheap at 120 US dollars a barrel. We'll start with the presentation and there will be time for questions and answers at the end, so please feel free to send them in during the presentation when you think of them and I will go through them at the end. My name is Nadia Martin Wigan. I am the energy analyst for fundamentals at Pareto Securities and we will be going through our latest views today. So starting with the main point, we think oil is cheap at $120 a barrel right now. When we look at everything going on from the micro side, on the oil markets themselves, on geopolitics, on product demand, uh, end product consumer demand, uh, the wholesale market, all of that together, we still assess that um, $120 a barrel is cheap. We think the market can trade comfortably between $130 and $135 a barrel for the next 9 to 12 months without any necessary breaks owing to too strong oil prices. We'll take you through what drives that view. So starting with oil, the state of trade. This morning we were back up above $120 a barrel on, in the Brent market. Um, we had hit there yesterday. Previously, you know, it was quite a while since we'd been that high, but we had hit actually uh, even higher in intraday trading um, in the last quarter when we hit basically $130 a barrel following um, rumors and concerns about uh, Russia's war in Ukraine and what that could mean in terms of sanctions. When we look at where we are within the cycle this year, you know, we can see that over the course of last year, oil prices were strengthening, then we had that pullback in the fourth quarter. But this year, really, when you look at that trend, we are actually continuing to go along that, ex except that we have had a lot of volatility uh, in the meantime, and that has been especially politically motivated. Um, when we look at Brent backwardation, it is steeper. This blue line at the bottom shows how flat the market was just um, at year end last year. So in December, you know, not much expectations after we'd come back from that COVID uh, demand uh, collapse. Uh, and then things look to be quite smooth in the 60s to 70s ranges, right? Now we continue to see that steepness and seasonally this is not surprising to us because now we've started the U.S. driving season officially last weekend as in the last weekend of May. Um, and we continue to see strong demand coming forward. In addition, we have had China stepping back from its lockdowns in Shanghai. China has not changed its policy officially in terms of zero COVID. They believe things are working, but the number of infections in Shanghai is way down. So there is still continued risk of uh, infections and therefore lockdowns coming, especially in regional areas um, around China and affecting um, both mobility amongst the Chinese people, as well as uh, the ability to do business and manufacturing if factories have to shut down because people can't go to work. Um, so that continues to be a risk. But in our view, um, you know, we know that China can actually continue to buy oil from the market to build up storage, although the latest pricing signals may be a little bit discouraging for them to do so. And we'll talk about that uh, in a minute. But what we can see is that this backwardation shows that there is continued need for oil in a very screaming way when we have this kind of backwardation. And I just want to remind our clients that, you know, this backwardation does not mean that oil prices are predicted to come down towards $70. It means that, you know, 2029 oil you can purchase currently for $70 a barrel. And when we look at where we are for next year, you know, that price is quite a bit lower than where we are right now. Um, and that to us, you know, if you're an oil trader, that's just a screaming buy because we see so much strength in demand continuing. Um, and 
through the nine uh, next nine to 12 months that you know this oil is especially cheap even though that front end oil relative um, to where we have space for oil prices to go um, is still quite low in our view. Now, as we've already discussed in previous sessions, you know, we do have the strong U.S. dollar. It is down from the peaks, but still this U.S. dollar index is high. And if we look at where it has been in the last five years, you know, this is a very high level. This chart just shows the last year. Um, we've had Europe officially, um, as in the European Union, pass sanctions on uh, Russian seaborne oil and after six months, European Union countries can no longer import Russian oil. But again, we still see that China and India and other countries will be able to continue to buy oil, which is why a typical relationship between um, US dollar strength hitting emerging market demand does not really hold. And this is where, you know, we have actually seen that um, exports of Russian oil have increased uh, quite significantly to China uh, to fill their SPR release, we believe, uh, or their previous SPR release that they had started doing last year in the fourth quarter when oil prices broke above 80 initially, um, and because that end user demand was not that high. Um, owing to these uh, lockdowns because of the zero COVID policy, right? So India, Turkey, they also typically really suffer from the strong U.S. dollar. We continue to believe that it is a two-tiered market and this trade can continue. Of course, it's further to sail to China than it is to stay in just Europe, to go from, you know, Primorsk or Uslaga over to Rotterdam. So it takes longer for the oil to get there and that of course also adds to the cost and utilizes the shipping fleet more but we do not see pressure on oil prices now coming from an ability to buy that oil now this was further supported by saudi arabia's recent release of the official selling prices uh, this past long weekend for us in norway so here we are looking at saudi arabia's official selling prices um, over to Asia. And I apologize for the subheading on the chart. These are the prices over to Asia, US dollars per barrel, right? And when we look back all the way to 2014, why are we looking at 2014 here? It's because 2014 was the last time when we entered the year which sets low OECD commercial stock levels like we entered this year, right? And that is what, since the start of the year, we've been talking about is 2022 looking like boom and bust in 2014, right? We have argued it is not because OPEC's bare capacity still exists. And as I started off this presentation saying, we believe that you know there is a lot of runway still to go on oil prices. Um, we're in a healthy range, demand is there, the markets are liquid. So we do not have this situation like in 2014. And also US supply, we'll go through this further in the presentation, is not growing at the speed that it could as a new player in 2014 to disrupt markets. You know, that was a real disruption on the supply side. This time we don't have that saving grace coming from the US, you know. So when we look at this chart, what do we see? You know, we had Saudi Arabia really raising oil prices um, from the start of this year. That was that like bottom dip. And then we saw that really sharp um, jump higher to May, and then we had a correction, right? And, and why did that correction happen on the pricing? That is because we had China start to pursue its zero COVID policy again, which at the start of the year, there had been discussions that it, you know, maybe China would go more in the way that Europe had gone and let things um, open up more and because of vaccines, let the virus spread in a controlled manner. Um, because of the low vaccination rate amongst older people in China, because of less effective vaccines in China, and because of the percentage of uh, 
older population, um, especially when we think about their uh, one-child policy. You know, those three factors have led them to continue to pursue this zero COVID strategy. Um, so as a result, Saudi Arabia lowered prices um, a bit. But when we look where they were historically, they're not that low. And that huge dip to the bottom is when we had uh, COVID 2020 uh, in the peak of the demand destruction. The hike to Asia this month is $2.10 on the main grade. And that is quite a steep hike when we've also had the oil price um, jump as well. You know, year to date, we're at $102.4 a barrel on the Brent price. We're trading at $119 today, $120. And the oil price further jumped on this news. And why did it? It's because by raising these prices, Saudi Arabia is showing that they see healthy demand at higher prices for their oil. And this is despite the fact that OPEC last week on uh, Thursday agreed to increase the targets for um, production, right? They raised the level so that the month on month increase is actually almost 650,000 barrels per day, month on month. However, what OPEC did not do, or OPEC plus, is they did not take Russia out of the mix. So individual countries still have their own targets. That entire 600 and almost 50,000 barrels per day month on month increase has not been allocated to Saudi Arabia, which could do it all. It has not been allocated to UAE, which could do it all. And it has not been allocated to Iraq that in our view could definitely bring on at least 200,000 barrels per day um, within a month if so pushed, right? So as a result, we see that although this target has been raised from 430,000 barrels per day to almost 650,000 barrels per day, OPEC will still come up short, right? Now what Saudi Arabia has further communicated is that even though they will be producing more, and it will be them, UAE, and uh, probably Iraq, uh, that will actually increase production um, next month, they still see healthy uh, demand and believe that prices need to be stronger. And this is despite the fact that, you know, we don't actually expect China and India to bu be buying these additional barrels. Saudi Arabia will be selling especially to Japan, for example, because Japan has been much more on board with uh, the Western, as in US and European stance on being anti-Russia in terms of imports relative to um, the Chinese. Even South Korea has been uh, more hesitant as well. So this is where Japan in particular is forced to pay these higher oil prices. We also interpret this move by Saudi Arabia, coupled with the fact that they did not remove Russia from the OPEC plus group, they did not remove them from the targets, that Saudi Arabia is actually saying to China that, well, first of all, um, we are not going to sell you our oil at a cheap price. So this, of course, when they've raised the price even higher, makes the Russian oil that is competing to go to China with Saudi oil look even cheaper. In addition, in our view, you know, there's a little bit of politics at play here because um, Saudi Arabia doesn't really want China to be buying Saudi crude oil in bulk to put into storage because they are concerned in, in the case that they are concerned that this war between Russia and Ukraine will continue and even escalate into the winter. And we could have a very cold winter. And this is, you know, China is the number one uh, oil importer in the world. They have huge energy needs. Yes, they're ramping up coal. Um, yes, they uh, have historically bought a lot of LNG. But this is where, you know, what we saw last year in the second half of the year, and especially in the last quarter of the year, they really increased their, their imports and they didn't allow a lot of exports. And so Saudi Arabia is basically saying that, okay, if you're going to take our oil, it's going to cost you uh, a lot. So really think about this. And this is what really encourages them also to buy that oil from Russia. So they, Saudi Arabia is basically, in our view, playing both sides because by giving in those extra production targets to the US, 
Saudi Arabia, ahead of Biden's visit later this month, um, is saying, yes, we are willing to try to help you and participate and improve our relationship. But what does Saudi Arabia really want from the U.S.? Well, Saudi Arabia has stated that, you know, they're not really going to increase production in the short run unless they get security guarantees against neighboring rebels, you know, basically the way Ukraine wants security guarantees, right? And the U.S., especially after the... Trump administration has not been that keen on uh, handing out these sorts of promises. And so this is what Saudi Arabia is doing. It's playing both sides and still appeasing and staying tight with uh, their Russian friends within OPEC by keeping them involved and allowing and basically giving a nod that, yes, you can continue to trade with some of our Asian customers. At the same time, we see that within Europe, prices have gone higher. Also, Saudi Arabia raised prices to Europe, um, to the Med and to Northwest Europe. And this is where, you know, more oil will also really flow. Some of that that would have normally gone to China. And they see the appetite here. Um, of course, not all crude is the same, um, as we have you know, discussed over the years that um, you know, we have more shale oil available to go into Europe. We have Brazilian oil that can come into Europe. We have North Sea oil that always comes in. You know, now we have um, more Saudi oil. They're not automatically um, all the same as Ural's oil. You know, the, the closest substitute to Ural's oil is really 40s crude, which comes out of the North Sea, and that is already you know, always bought up. So, and Johan Sverdrup is another potential. So there, there are changes with that, and, and as a result, we will have these changes within the pricing um, for individual grades. We will see some cargos trading not the way they have historically, and that creates opportunities for the physical oil market, and it also creates inefficiencies when these things happen. But the overriding message from Saudi Arabia is that they see strong demand for their oil. They did not change the prices over to the U.S. at all. Again, this is appeasing uh, the U.S. administration, so they just kept them flat. They didn't lower them, but they kept them flat, and so that's as if they were lowering them when they raised them everywhere else. It's relatively less expensive. So moving on to the next slide on the paper side. What, what is going on uh, aside from the physical market? Well, this is where in this gray line we see the Brent price, and then in that navy blue line you see the net positioning, right? Because in futures options contracts we have shorts for longs. And what we see here is that, yes, that open interest um, in terms of length, sorry, not the open interest, the amount of longs holding Brent has increased, but still, it's not at the level we even saw at the start of this year or what we saw in the peak after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So the market is still uh, in this uh, medium level. We have had on the Brent side, um, especially, we've had the shorts come down because you know, we're going into the main driving season. Um, so that is not uh, a shock. When we look at uh, the gas oil side, you know, this gray line reflects the gas oil crack. And as you can see, that's been extremely volatile. You know, when we hit the previous highs a couple weeks ago, you know, that was so expensive. Um, but, you know, the crack is showing what is the gas oil price less the input price of the crude oil, right? And so this is where, you know, we see that there is still runway for oil prices to increase because we have strong cracks which are pushing refiners to run as much as possible. In the U.S., refiners are running at full capacity, you know, and this is where the situation in China is very, very important because China sits on the world's spare refining capacity. Yes, we have new refineries coming online in the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia, um, but where we really have that excess capacity is in China, but China hasn't been allowing that many exports of products. So some of that spare capacity is sitting idly. And so this is what the market is waiting for. But again, for 
us to have diesel or gasoline flow all the way from China to the US. It's not an efficient way for things to happen. This has supported product tanker prices. Um, and it's still not going to arrive in time um, you know, for next week as summer holidays increasingly kick off. So when we look at the positioning in uh, the gas oil market, um, and the reason we're looking at gas oil here and not just um, gasoline is because gas oil is closer to diesel, um, which also reflects not only the heating market, but also the real economy and what is going on um, in terms of demand and industry and so forth. And you know, this is something that it even affects the shale industry where we should see with oil prices where they are huge jumps in production but it is expensive you know some of the these rigs that are being deployed they are less efficient they have more diesel demand you know that's worth an additional 200,000 barrels per day in the season because we're having to use less efficient uh, um, products you know or machinery so that is where um, we still see though that the positioning is uh, relatively low. So there are a lot more longs that can come into the market. Um, when we look at the state of US petroleum stocks and we're focusing on the US because it is the most transparent, we see that they continue to be off the charts low. The first slide in the top left, or chart in the top left, it is showing overall oil and uh, crude oil and products and this is on the commercial side then we have the crude stocks next to that they're really low then we have gasoline stocks they are extremely low when demand should be picking up and we have distillates so this is where we are in an extremely tight situation and you know how high can gasoline prices go at the pump well it's impossible to say as we learned with covid when we had a uh, negative pricing you know where is the limit five dollars a barrel six dollars a barrel eight dollars a barrel higher it is possible because we have a lot of liquidity still and we have this pent-up demand since um COVID, the biggest holdup is really the logistics side. When we look at, for example, the uh, jet fuel market, you know, will we continue to have the kinds of cancellations that we've had to see because of personnel problems and so forth? You know, we see traffic in Europe picking up now, but it's still not moving as smoothly as uh, we would have expected when we were looking at these balances last year. You know, we really thought that by April we would be absolutely higher on, on demand um, uh, than we were, that the jet market would be normalized. We are thinking that on an absolute number that jet could be back at that 2019 number um, this summer, even though it will be in pockets that it will be higher demand than it used to be and in other places lower demand. So for example, internal China, we still expect to be lower than where it was in 2019 because of these partial zero COVID uh, policies needing to be deployed. So how did we get here? Just to remind ourselves, um, 2008 was the last time, was the first time since I was in the oil market that we saw such low commercial levels um, as we had at the start of this year in the OECD countries for um, inventories, crude and products together. 2014 was the second time, and then we had it at the start of this year. Both of those previous years were boom and bust. You know, we continue to be booming, but we don't see that bust coming this year because of where we started on the spare capacity side. Um, and although we have had to decrease that number and we continue to decrease it into the next year, um, we still do not see it at that kind of dire level um, that we saw back then. However, when we look at the start of next year, spare capacity will be, in our view, down to 1.4 million barrels per day, which is lower than what we had in 2014 when we had 1.8 million barrels per day. So that is where you know next year looks uh, alarming, potentially, in terms of oil prices really jumping because of that lack of spare capacity, and then jumping that high, trading up there for a while, and then uh, causing demand destruction that can then push an oil price down. Um, 
when we see where we are, you know, physically to date, we have continued to draw down. And this is why next year will be even tighter than this year. And when we look at what the agencies put out in their latest um, reports uh, this last month in May was the last ones out. We're the last ones out on the left hand side here. We're looking at the implied balances of what they've seen and they just do not connect um, in terms of what we've actually seen drawn down in the market, right? So we were at a much tighter base already to start with. Still, you know, one of our biggest criticism of the agency's uh, forecast is really the IEA's view on Russian oil and how much that production will come down in the short term. Um, and then in, in general, we think demand was much higher uh, in the second half of last year than what they see. And why do we talk about this? It's because, you know, they're starting from too low a base. So even when, you know, they don't have the demand numbers for this year as strong as we do, we can see the evidence is that they have been too low. When we look at the EIA here on the right hand side, the EIA is the only one that actually forecasts through the end of next year because the IEA and OPEC uh, do not publish an official uh, forecast for OPEC production. Um, we see that the EIA, for example, they start to see builds, of, well, they start to see builds already in the second quarter, and they see that continuing through the end of the year, we actually see draws and a flat fourth quarter. Um, next year, we start to see builds, and this is where, you know, we see slightly less U.S. production. We see higher demand um, overall globally. That is the biggest difference. But we'll go through our balances uh, in um, this next section. So searching for oil in this wild market, we have finally had the EU agree that they will no longer take Russian seaborne imports. But... This is not officially effective for six months for crude, right? So that means we really have until year end to wind down these Russian imports. This is something that, you know, the VTOLs and Trafiguras had already been communicating a couple months ago that they will no longer be trading in this crude. Now it is official. They found a way to work around it with, um, you know, Hungary, Slovakia, and some of these uh, more landlocked countries that do not have an easy way to substitute Russian crude, right? So they are on board. They have some exemptions initially, um, but it still makes it official. And it also exposes what is happening on the shipping side and makes the insurances harder to have. You know, what we see happening is that, you know, once you are a tanker that takes Russian crude to China, you cannot then suddenly start working within the European market. So it's really creating two separate fleets in terms of what is tainted crude and what is clean crude. So it's another element of this two-tiered market. Now, on the product side, um, there is an eight-month grace period, so that's worth another two to two and a half million barrels per day um, in terms of what will not be imported directly from Russia. However, the EU has not made this complete embar embargo that says that, okay, if we know that India or China or Turkey, well, is importing Russian crude and then they refine that, we cannot take those refined products. That, that is not the case. European Union members will be able to import products from China, from India, or any country that may or may not be running Russian crude. Why is that? Well, first of all, it's very difficult based on a refined product to know which kind of crude it was made from. It is mixed in. We already have this problem with CPC, which is, which is the right hand uh, chart here that we have this mixture of Russian crude coming in with Kazakhstani crude and uh, Azuri crude, right? And that is, uh, it's impossible to pull that out. So even more so on the refined products side, it would have to mean then a boycott of all refined products from a country that runs Russian crude. And that, as I've already mentioned, 
because China sits on the only spare real spare refining capacity in the world, it's something that is impossible um, for the Western world to uh, fathom doing right now, to halt that option. So that is why those are not uh, going to be included. But it, of course, builds up um, new trade routes and less efficient ones uh, going forward. So when we look at OPEC supply, you know, because we've had OPEC plus bring forward some of the production that was supposed to come gradually um, over the next quarter, uh, already in this last meeting that for the next two months they are actually speeding things up. Um, we also see a decline in OPEC spare capacity by year end by the mere nature that they are actually um, running more crude. And this is where we have it at 1.9 barrels per day, but you know, it is not fully transparent what exactly is Saudi Arabia spare capacity. So there are some of our consultants we use that have much lower spare capacity numbers available. In our view, as a safe number, 1.4 million barrels per day at year end um, from OPEC is a safe, uh, reliable number, uh, we believe, like for sure. Um, but right now, it could be as much as 1.9 million barrels per day. Um, it is, of course, driven by those three countries that I've already mentioned, um, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Iraq. Iraq is tricky, though, because how much extra supply can be actually sent into the market historically always has a lot of logistic problems, um, getting things shipped out even when they mean to. And of course, there is always the geopolitical risk. Um, which is something to keep in mind. You know, Saudi Arabia is producing more already, which is a good thing in our planning to, uh, in our view, because we're also now in June and we have a hurricane season approaching. So we can actually have a serious situation happening in the Atlantic Ocean um, where we could have potentially U.S. supply derailed in the Gulf of Mexico. And this is when we look at non-OPEC supply um, through the end of the next year. It is really driven especially by U.S. shale. And this is something that we have really had to change our outlook on uh, over the course of this year, from the start of this year. You know, at the start of this year, our base case outlook was that U.S supply growth, we are bullish on the prices, would have to be 1.2 million barrels per day at a minimum. And if oil prices got really strong, um, you know, we didn't have Iran coming back. Then we were talking about 130 to $135 a barrel without Iran. That's now our view again. Um, then we would potentially see 1.4 or even 1.5 million barrels per day of year-on-year -year growth. Um, but it's just simply impossible. And now what we can see in terms of, you know, what's happened with frac activity, what's happening with employee constraint, is that at a maximum, we believe that only 900,000 barrels per day of year-on-year -year growth from the U.S. can come. So that changes things quite a lot. In that first quarter of next year, we'll start to see an acceleration in that growth. But we have been behind in terms of... Um, the supply um, boost to date. And this is where we do see the majors still continuing to pursue strategies um, in shale. You know, we have ConocoPhillips, for example. They really are pushing to continue to grow that. They are less concerned about pricing um, overall um, because their shareholders do not only punish them for their break even prices within the U.S. shale patch, right? It's their overall patch. And when we have sh um, shortfalls in production coming in other places, then of course, U.S. shale, which can historically come to market much quicker um, based on activity, that is quite helpful. We also have the independent uh, shale producers. Um, by that, I mean private equity backed ones. So they're not traded. They're not subject to shareholders um, used as much, and we see them actually absolutely continuing to increase uh, production. And when we had our rig analyst from Pareto, you know, he was over in Houston a couple years ago. What he really saw 
And this is something that we had been seeing in terms of the overall production numbers coming in lower than we had expected while read counts continued to go up. When he was speaking with um, actual traded independent shale companies, they were saying that they uh, cannot grow at the kind of levels that prices would historically suggest um, because of these constraints that are hitting um, prices so that then it will inflate all of their costs and then that would tighten their margin potentially and that is something that shareholders do not want to see so they are really um, staying tight compared to where the prices would suggest and that is why we've had to revise these numbers lower. S but over the course of next year, we will continue to see um, these rises happen. And that is, of course, because we expect to be in that $130, $135 range. So then production will move higher. And some of these supply constraints will have been worked through, right? When we look at Iran and Venezuela, two other saviors, saviors um, to the supply side of the equation, we still do not see any decisive action. You know, this chart on the left-hand side was showing 1.3 million barrels per day coming into the market. Uh, if an Iran deal were signed by April, now it seems like you know that deal may really never get done. There are, of course, a lot of concerns on the security side that has been raised by Russia's attack on Ukraine, on what's going on with the Middle East. And of course, right now, the US is uh, really trying to improve relations with Saudi Arabia, who is you know, right now quite close with Russia. So Saudi Arabia and Iran are, of course, um, safe to say, basically enemies. Um, so it is where it's very difficult, I think, for um, the U.S. to suddenly allow um, Iran back into the easily um, traded market um, by, uh, you know, and by doing things like allowing Iran's uh, revolutionary forces to suddenly be no longer considered terrorists. This is not the kind of environment where that can easily be done. So from our perspective, we do not see that deal actually happening. So where do we put in oil trickling through in our balances? You know, next year, you know, first half of the year, 300,000 barrels per day. That's it. Um, and even that may not happen. You know, Iran, Venezuela, they have a relationship. So there could see some more oil flowing out of those, but nowhere near what the market needs. When we look at Venezuela, you know, within 12 months, we think 800,000 barrels per day of production could come online. Um, then we do not uh, see any, any of that really coming. But something to remember, though, if a deal is made within, within you know, two months, we would see at least 250,000 barrels per day. So that would help. So what does all this mean in terms of our balances? Well, you know, we're starting here with 2020. So first two quarters were huge builds. Um, then we had a huge draw in the third quarter, draws continuing. Um, we now see um, for this current quarter, um, 800,000 barrels per day draw, so second quarter this year, which is parallel with what we saw in the first quarter. And then we see that accelerating to a 1 million barrel per day draw, despite this extra production coming from OPEC and our conservative view of Russia of around 2 million barrels per day down. We've seen historically around 1.2 to 1.3 out so far versus where they were at the start of the year. We now see a flat balance in the fourth quarter that is especially driven by the fact that the US is not coming in with additional uh, production as the price would suggest. It affects also the third quarter, but especially uh, into that fourth quarter. When we look at next year, we see much smaller builds than we had initially expected um, until kind of the fourth quarter. And we do include a view on the macroeconomic environment that things will slow. We still, in our base case, see the potential for, or assume a soft landing, so slowed growth. Um, and that starts to hit the balances really in the fourth quarter. 
but we are already at very, very low inventories. And what we have to remember is SPR releases are ongoing now. And if that oil price continues to get stronger or Biden's visit with Saudi Arabia does not go well, then we expect the US government to make additional SPR releases and other governments potentially as well. What does that mean? It means that 2023, we need to rebuild that SPR. We do not think the war with Russia will be finished um, um, or with Ukraine by Russia will be finished by then. So this is where we have to continue to actually figure out a way to refill these barrels. So that puts a floor on prices. So what is our price outlook? So for this year, 2022, we raise it from $112 a barrel, we raise it to 116. That reflects for the second half of this year, above $130 a barrel. For next year, we still left it unchanged at $120 a barrel. We see upside to this. Um, especially if we have a cold winter and we have the greater demand um, for oil. 2024 is still at 90 as we have U.S. shale coming back to the market, but in a um, larger, slower fashion, as in we'll get more supply growth in 2024. That is when we are looking at, you know, back up there to one point to 1.3 million barrels per day year-on-year year growth. Long term, we still keep at 70, but this is, of course, conservative with the outlook now, but there will be periods when we undershoot and overshoot that. So when we look at the EMP valuations, we still continue to have $100 as our you know, conservative positive case. Um, and these are the companies we cover. We have four energy Ocker, BP, and Lundin, and Equinor on the left-hand side as they have the largest production numbers out of our coverage space. Um, and then we have $70 as our bare you know, recessionary type environment case. And we still see a lot of upside in these equities. It has not been priced in. And our viewpoint is that you know, 130 to $135 a barrel Brent very comfortable trading range. We need prices to go higher for that oil to get to where it needs to be quickly um, before the supply side can recover. So that is why that price will continue uh, to go higher. So when we look at that medium term and energy security, you know, that is where things are changing. And, you know, we still have not changed our peak demand outlook before 2028. Uh, to 2030, as we've discussed in the past, it does depend a lot on what happens in Russia, on how steep a decline we see uh, coming in those later years. But we absolutely can see 500,000 barrels per day, 1 million barrels per day, year on year decline in Russia coming from you know, 2025 and beyond. So that is something that alongside that demand number we need to see. Of course, High oil prices will encourage uh, more uh, development on the renewable side and some switching. But of course, you know, when the gas price is uncertain and so volatile and expensive, um, and that is feeding into the power side, it makes it um, maybe not the optimal time to make that big capital spend to change to an electric car. Um, and especially in these de developing markets that have not built out the infrastructure. So we have not accelerated our demand viewpoint yet, but this is something that we will of course continue to watch um, over the course of the summer. So oil prices must stimulate investment as you are all very aware, we have these high decline rates and this is where you know when we look at what we've seen for example in the north sea and the norwegian continental shelf we have not seen um, any project being sanctioned for more than 35 dollars a barrel break even so when we go back to our long-term oil price you know 70 dollars that's extremely 
conservative if we're only going to continue to sanction these lower cost projects. Um, as we have to choose different geographies based on geopolitics and things like that, some of those break-evens will potentially be more expensive when we build out new regions that may not have all of that existing infrastructure. But you know, we're still nowhere near um, where we've been historically on that project uh, sanctioning spend. And this is where we see that continued pessimism about spending. We do see you know, that rig companies, rig owners are starting to get excited. There's going to be a lot of activity in the Middle East. There has to be because of this spare capacity getting so low. We're going into a hurricane season. We have this geopolitical unrest um, in the Middle East. Potentially in Europe, we have this full-fledged war going on in Europe. So that absolutely needs to be uh, developed and invested in, and that is where we are very excited. But when we think about how much money the market is thinking will be spent on this, you know, they it, it still has the memory of 2014. And this is where you know, we believe that when you always remember your, your losses more than your wins. And... 2014 really did a lot of damage uh, to the market, um, you know, on that expectations on the, on the rig side and, and that kind of collapse. And this is where there's a lot of hesitation and people want to be the first to call that, okay, there will be a downturn. Of course, there are always upturns and downturns. It's a cyclical business, but we do not see a case at all that we need to have that kind of downturn because we haven't had it, that kind of activity or spending and, you know, the market is much more cautious and shareholders are much more cautious because they are concerned about how long will this actual cycle last. So this is where we see a lot of runway. And again, unfortunately, on the Russia-Ukraine peace side, we do not see that moving forward. Again, there is an overriding view right now from the Western countries that you know Ukraine must actually win this somehow because Russia cannot just go back and regroup and attack again. What does a win mean? That's very complicated, you know. But for right now, the weapons are continuing to flow to Ukraine. Ukraine is, still has morale and is fighting hard. Um, and so that's when we look at how things are, you know, just to quickly go to gas and power. Gas prices have come down a lot from those peaks. And we do see that Russia is continuing to pump um, gas over to Europe. We have gas inventories are above the five-year average as in 2015 to 2019. We're in a good situation. The EU is on course to try to build this, you know, 80% storage level and LNG imports continue to be higher, right? But now we do have China coming out of COVID. So that is going to affect how much LNG is available, so much probably it will drive um, gas prices a bit higher here. Um, but you know, Russia could actually pump more gas into Europe if they wanted to. So there is <coughs> always that potential. So we expect to see power prices that are high, you know, this year, next year, and continue to be high so that we can pull in all these sources. But this will have that effect on the oil price that we will again need to see that kind of maximum substitution most likely towards oil demand. Um, we do not, as a result, think because of what has happened um, on the oil sanction side, they were actually quite difficult to push through. Um, and so it looks less likely right now that Russian gas sanctions would be passed uh, you know, in the coming rounds uh, this year without an escalation by Russia in the war, you know, meaning chemical, nuclear, or I don't even want to think about what else they could potentially do. Um, and so we, we don't have that playing into our base case uh, right now because that would cause real demand destruction. And so I, it will be difficult for countries to actually agree to this uh, across the board. Um, but if it is a cold winter, we will definitely see that scream higher for oil and for coal and for gas 
as we have discussed. But now we're going into the summer, which should hopefully be high renewable season. Um, so a lot of wind power, a lot of solar power should mean that Europe uses less gas so it can stay in storage instead of uh, being used incrementally now. Um, so thank you very much. I will finish on that note uh, just to say that the oil market in and of itself looks <laughs> extremely tight, will continue to trade higher uh, in our view. And the secondary size of power demand and uh, what happens on the gas side will probably support it further. Thank you.